Hi, and welcome, and thank you all for being with us this evening. My name is Alex Giannini, and I'm, one of, I'm the program manager at the Westport Library. Tonight, I'm so excited to welcome back two dear friends for an evening of conversation and general mischief. Briefly, <laughs> I'd like to mention that if you have a question for either Sam or JW, please use the Ask a Question feature right below me. Uh, and, and now let's get on to our main event. Sam Weller's debut short story collection, Dark Black, is a genre mashup that's just as much Joey Ramone as it is Ray Bradbury, as nostalgic as it is all new and all different. Dark Black hits all the right notes and is the perfect read for a cold autumn evening. Sam is also Ray Bradbury's authorized biographer, and he's written the definitive tomes on the literary legend. He's won two Bram Stoker awards, and most importantly, he's a hell of a guy, and I am proud to call him my friend. J.W. Oker is keeping Halloween alive one haunted road trip at a time. A true renaissance man of all things eerie, J.W. once again delivers a creepy classic with his latest, Cursed Objects, a book that will remind you of the days spent poring over the old Time Life Enchanted World series, if you remember those as I do. Uh, J.W. is also the host of the Odd Things I've Seen podcast and YouTube channel, both of which are must, especially this time of year. Personally, J.W.'s Salem travelogue, A Season with the Witch, Help me and my wife plan out our honeymoon. And for that, I am forever grateful. <laughs> That's awesome. Gentlemen, welcome both of you. And thank you for being with us this evening. No, I appreciate the invite. Yeah, uh, thanks for having us, Alex. This is great to be here. I love general mischief. You're absolutely correct. Let's get going. <laughs> so, well, to, to dive into some specific mischief, Sam, I, I, I'd love to kick off the, the evening with, with a reading from uh, each of your new books. So since I don't know if we can see Jay yet, um, let's start with you, Sam, if, if you wouldn't mind reading a little bit from uh, Dark Black. I'd be happy to. Thanks so much, you guys, and, and welcome everybody who's here over in the chat. We're seeing all of your comments, and um, you know, this is basically my third you know, time participating in StoryFest, first time virtually, but this is a, you know, a, a festival of, of celebrating the word like no other. So Alex and all the all the Folks behind the scenes, do you guys all do such a great job? Thanks so much for this, and welcome everybody. Um, Alex mentioned this book. This is what I'll be reading from it. Just officially out September twenty second. Although the publisher made it available in a kind of cheeky way, uh, going back to June, so all those copies could be signed and sold directly through the publisher. You really, if we're going to kind of peer behind the curtain of publishing. Um, Amazon, you know, publishers don't make a whole lot of money. So if you order directly, it always helps the publisher. It always helps the artist. And so this book, as as Alex said in his wonderful introduction, um, you know, is is twenty gothic um, stories. Uh, some are funny. Some are very sad. Some I hope are spooky. Um, and so I, I thought I would read a, a very short piece in here. There's really sort of three little vignettes little flash fiction pieces and I thought I would read one of those and it's not scary I know a lot of people when we think of this time of year the spooky season as we've been calling it and Halloween and we think of fear and scary stories but having worked with Ray Bradbury for 12 years um, you know <clears throat> autumn is just as much a part of the season and the colors of autumn and the smells of autumn and then the nostalgia of autumn and that's really what I tried to uh, go for with this with this story every story in this book is illustrated it was something that was really important for me to do um by a by a rock music illustrator by the name of dan jetza and so uh, the story i'll be reading uh, this evening uh is, is just not even two pages it's called end of summer <clears throat> and the only thing you need to know is some of these stories are very slightly connected and we reference uh, uh, there's a character who is referenced in here who has passed away. Even though it's short stories, there are there are a few through threads. Uh, my best friend died in real life when I was a young guy, and 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 he's mentioned, and really his his specter, his spirit, looms over this book in a very positive and loving way. His name was Danny, and so he's mentioned in here. End of summer. Beyond the fringe of suburbia beyond the circuit board of cul-de-sacs and prefab homes, out past the strip of soulless big box stores and interchangeable auto dealerships, far past the last country cemetery on the outskirts of town where Mrs. O'Brien is buried, far out into the fields of moonscape dirt and lion-hued stubble, we walked, me and the stick man and Mib. It was September and the last day of summer. 
The sunlight was white and had let go of its bakery oven warmth. When you are young, 15, and you live where the suburbs vanish and the rural begins, you walk a lot. You explore. Stickman was a year younger than me. He was skeleton tall and skeleton thin. Mib was my 13-year-old mutt of many mysterious breeds, black and white and spotted and long-haired and runty and sweet. The days were shorter, darker, sadder. Weekends like this were minuscule islands, rocks in the creek of the institutional school week to step upon. The sky was monochromatic, a hardware paint sample strip of various grays. In the wind, there was cinder and ash, goldenrod and thistle, fallen leaf and pumpkin and honeycrisp apple. Hell, maybe it carried with it cauldron double double toil and trouble, candy corn, cinnamon stick, dust of monarch migration, dandelion puff, homecoming bonfire, early love, Indian summer. Well, maybe that wasn't in the air, but it sure seems like it was. We walked, Mib was out in front of us, no leash, free, sniffing every prairie dog hole and cow patty, red barns in the distance, a lone Cessna far up in the sky navigating the winds. We walked out into the fields with the huge electrical towers in the distance, steel lattice and humming high voltage spider line draping on to the end of the earth. Mib panted. When he was happy, content, he had a smile, pink tongue and tartar teeth. Me and Stick talked about school and our favorite bands and our favorite movies, and we missed Danny. He used to walk with us too. It's weird without him, Stick man said as we moved along. We were the only ones in the world at that place at that moment. It's like an empty space in a missing man plane formation. Danny loved military jets. He would have understood what Stick had just said. But with a Houdini snap of a finger, Danny was gone. We could make no sense of it. Thank God I still had the Stick man, my friend, walking with me here and there. Down the road, we wouldn't always stay in touch. We would move on. I closed my eyes and we walked. So that's just a very brief little vignette really about loss and grief and autumn. Um, so thanks for, for indulging me for a moment there. Thank you, Sam. Thank I, you, Sam. I, 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 um, thank uh, you. We'll get into we'll the get into the later. later, later, later so for the time being, time being uh, uh, you, did you ask? I didn't hear that last question. Oops, sorry. I was echoing. I think I'm back. Yeah. Did, uh, would you, you uh, mind reading a little bit from uh, Cursed Objects? Sure. How do I sound? Am I echoing? Or am I good? Do you, want me to, do you want me to mute? Yeah, Sam, we'll mute while we're not. Yeah. Awesome. So I, was, I assume that you'll unmute if you can't hear me or something. All right, great. So Sam, you know, gave us a nice heartfelt story that he just read to us. I'm going to go in the opposite direction and read something not at all heartfelt. So my, uh, so I, my book is Cursed Objects. It's a nonfiction book that just talks about, you know, Every infamous item I could see, visit, learn about, some that are lost to history, some that are, you know, dubitable, and some that are not dubitable. Uh, so I thought what I would do, um, I can't write a nonfiction book without putting myself in it. It's just something I have to do. The, the word I appears in more of my books than any other word, I think. So when I was decided to do the Cursed Objects book, I knew I'd have to get involved more than just writing about the Cursed Objects. So what I did was... I bought a cursed object and I want to read you that section um, of when I bought a cursed object just for a book gimmick. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and start that. It's called Cursed on eBay, in case you want to know. It's in the uh, business of cursed objects section. You don't have to dig through dark castle attics or the baked soil of long disappeared civilizations to find cursed objects. You just have to grab your phone and go to eBay. At any given time, scores of cursed objects are for sale in the online auction site. Dolls, stones, jewelry, statuettes, ashes of demons. It's all on there. I know because I, I bought a cursed object off eBay when I started writing this book. In fact, some of the more infamous modern cursed objects have ended up on eBay at some point, like the infamous Dybbuk box and Bill Stoneham's 1972 painting, The Hands Resist Him. My cursed object wasn't so famous as these or as expensive. But facing a year-long immersion into the world of cursed objects, I decided that I had to buy one. 
and eBay just seemed a safer bet than heisting the Hope Diamond or redefiling Tut's tomb. So I typed cursed objects into, this, into the search bar and found countless wonders. I found a cursed wooden Afghan mask, circa 1988, that came from the home of a, quote, ex-Satanist and chaos magician, and had been adjacent to various dark rituals and acts of violence. I found a cursed wooden bowl stand from the apartment of evicted Satanists that caused people to see shadow people, feel phantom touches, and hear voices. It could also hold a mean bowl pretty well. There's also a cursed pocket watch that held the demon spirit of a Moldavian evil nurse, a cursed Buddha head that made items disappear and cats fall over, a small cursed wooden box owned by the seller's grandfather who had killed himself. It contained two chess pieces that switched places in the box when you weren't looking. The starting bid was $1,000 or $49 installments for 24 months. A cursed Dybbuk box, a cursed Dybbuk brooch, a cursed Dybbuk painting, and dolls. So, 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 so many creepy dolls. I chose my cursed object carefully. Turns out many of them have reserves in the three figures. I wasn't about to invest that much into what was basically a book gimmick. In fact, I spent so much time trying to find the perfect cursed object that eBay started running targeted ads for me for cursed objects across my online experience. Cursed items on eBay. Seriously, we have cursed items. That was one headline of one of the ads. Eventually, I found the perfect object. It was the right size, the right type, the right cost. It was a bronze bulldog, about three and a half inches long and two inches tall, and its opening price was only 11 bucks, plus 378 shipping. The seller was from North Carolina. She had a strong positive feedback rating, but it was her eBay summary that really won me over. And here's that eBay summary exactly. Cursed object, evil, beware, brass or bronze bulldog. My father, who collected dog figurines, purchased this when he was a boy in the 1930s from a Chinese business. The owner of the business did not want to sell it, but my dad persisted, and the man sold it with the warning that he would curse it, which I'm pretty sure this isn't in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the book, but I'm pretty sure that's how Gremlin started the entire movie. Anyway, uh, the shop owner mumbled a curse as my dad left with the dog, and since then, my family has been burdened all my life, unable to get ahead financially, illness, family strife. I need to rid our life of this horrid curse. Please let me end this. Purchase it. Give it to your worst enemy, your ex-husband, or anyone else you want to inflict bad luck and sadness on. Absolutely no refunds or returns on this object. I do not want this in my presence anymore. I am starting this at $11 because 11 is my lucky number, hoping this will begin a new phase in my family's life. I ended up being the only bidder. When I won, I received an email letting me know that the cursed object would be on its way as soon as the seller cleansed her house and officially passed the curse on to mine. I awaited the tracking number. She really knew what I was looking to hear, I think, and made me think that perhaps that's what she was actually selling, an experience. The idea was further supported when I received the box a mere four days later. I can see why she had such a good rating on eBay. It was an ordinary USPS priority mail small flat rate box. On its white cardboard flanks, she had written war more warnings in to me in pink ink. May you live in interesting times. May you attract the attention of people in power. May you get what you asked for. That last sentence was underlined. When I pulled the eagerly awaited cursed object out of the box, it was heavy for its size, making me think it might be a paperweight. I scrutinized the dull metal but could find no identifying marks anywhere on the pooch, which helped, me, which helped the story a good bit. The last thing I wanted to see punched into its belly was Made in China or Copyright 2019. I received the item in early March, and I set it on a shelf in my office. For the next two months, while I worked on this book, the cursed dog stared at me from its perch, and every once in a while, I would pause after writing a sentence about a victim of a cursed object and stare back. But by the end of April, nothing bad had happened to me. Nothing at all. So I decided to up the stakes. I took it on vacation with me. I stuck it in my backpack, and my family flew down to St. Augustine, Florida for a week, which, yes, maybe was slightly inconsiderate to the rest of the people on that plane. I didn't tell my wife about the stunt until we were... Until we were huh until we were relaxed and sunburnt a few days in. I could have gone the whole vacation without knowing that, she said. But the vacation was a great one. Overall, and somewhat disappointingly, it was really a great year for me in numerous ways. And while having a souvenir of my time visiting and researching cursed objects is well worth the $11 plus shipping, part of me wished that it would have introduced enough weird chaos into my life that I would have been forced to send it to one of the haunted museums, maybe John Zaffis's in Connecticut, or Zach Bagan's out in Nevada, or the Newkirk's uh, in Kentucky. But who knows, like every dog, maybe this one's still getting used to the new home before its personality really starts to assert itself. And I will say an addendum that I still have that dog. It is still in my study. It is right here. And I've named it because every single cursed object worth its salt has a name. And it's always a name that sounds like it's from a mystery story, from a Sherlock Holmes story, right? So Sherlock Holmes and the mystery of the Hope Diamond. I've named this the Cursed Cur. So it's now, you know, Sherlock Holmes and the mystery of the Cursed Cur. And, you know, it's with me 
I guess until I pass it on to the next person. <laughs> so we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> That's so great. Thank you, JW. Awesome. Yeah. So thank you. Both. And, and uh, so I want to, so quickly uh, to the audience, if you, if you don't have copies of the books yet, check the comments, the links in the comments to go grab yours. Um, and let's, let's actually, let's just start with the books themselves because I mean, you can't look at them and not, they're, they're just gorgeous. They're gorgeous artifacts. Uh, Jay's is so shiny. <laughs> uh, but and and we'll start with Sam. But you, so yours is illustrated beautifully throughout. So my question is to both of you. But how did you get so lucky with the covers? And second, Sam, can you talk about the illustrations throughout and and how? Uh, I mean, did you have a say of what was being drawn or or, or um, kind of artistic free reign there? Yeah, you know, um, it was really important to me to have this book illustrated. As you said at the top, you know, I. I Ray Bradbury for 12 years as his biographer, and a number of his books were illustrated by a great award-winning illustrator named Joseph Mignani. He illustrated uh, very famously uh, Fahrenheit 451, that paper man, a fire. He did il story illustrations in books like The Golden Apples of the Sun and The October Country. So out of the gate, I knew I wanted to have illustrations in this book. When I received uh, JW's book, the thing that really caught my attention right away, as you said, is that sort of stamping on it but also interestingly enough these insanely beautiful end pages which was really important to me <laughs> you know and, and it's like jw and i are like bradbury brothers separated at birth that we, I, you know it's just really bizarre that uh, these books have such similar aesthetics and i really admire his publisher i think cork did this book I mean, they, do, they put together great books. And when I took Dark Black out with my agent, I mean, she, I mean, I'm just going to be really honest. She's like, don't tell anybody you want this thing illustrated. And I'm like, why? And she said, no New York publisher is going to want to deal with that. Quirk is in Philadelphia, if memory serves correct. I mean, I think a lot of, there's a lot of publishers who they're obviously very bottom line oriented. So um, I went, I ended up going with a publisher in Los Angeles who had done a very special edition of a Bradbury book of mine. They're called Hat and Beard Press, and they're known as art book publishers. I mean, their whole ethos is producing a war, a book that is an object to art. It's, a, it's it, as you said, Alex, you know, these books kind of feel good in the hand. They're, they're, they're handsome editions that you're proud to hold in your hand or to have sitting on a coffee table. And so that was really important to me. Um, I had met the illustrator years back at a music festival and and he knew who i was he, he he said i'm familiar with your work on bradbury and i said well i love your artwork uh i'm working on a collection of short stories would you be interested ever in illustrating it and he said sold count me in and so every story as he said um has an illustration and we really work together very closely like this is a story about a writer who rents the clutter murder house um, he finds that the Clutter Murder House is available on like a vacationrental.com site and decides to go rent it. The Clutter Murder House was made famous in Truman Capote's book in Cold Blood. And he rents it to go finish his book with really disastrous, uh, you know, kind of a downward spiral of, of neuroses. Um, and so, yeah, I, Alex, I worked with the illustrator Dan Jetza really closely on every illustration. We would talk about the story. I mean, it was beautiful. He read each story and then would come back and say, here's my idea. What's your idea? And it was very collaborative. I mean, I've done a graphic novel with IDW. And when you work, JW knows this, and, and Alex, you certainly know this as an author. When you work with great editors, great publishers, great agents, the collaborative process makes your work dramatically better. The collaborative process, if you work with hacks or people who uh, – you know, don't bring a lot to the table can make it worse. But when you align yourself with really talented people like JW did with Quirk, I'm envious of that partnership. They're such a great house. Um, it makes the book way better than anything you could have done. So thanks for asking about that. It, well, it's interesting. One of the, uh, and I'll get to JW in a second, just because uh, one of my, my notes to, to follow up with you is that it really felt collaborative as a comic or graphic novel would be created. So I, as reader coming in cold to it, definitely got that feeling. Um, and JW, in your, your book, I'd love to hear the story. I mean, did you work with the illustrator? Did you know it was going to be this beautiful? Cause, I mean, just, no, I, Sam nailed it. Sam nailed it with the, with the publisher. Quirk is 
Quirk really believes in their books. Mm -hmm. I, just just grab any novel of theirs off the shelf, off the shelf, and you know take the take the dust wrapper off, and you'll see a completely beautiful hardcover underneath it. Because which you might never see if you don't take that off, because they kind of scrutinize every part of it. They believe like that books are objects, like, like artifacts, that they need to be artifacts. They're not just mass produced, but they're, they're artifacts. And Quirk was really good about this. They, for, from the beginning, they wanted this to be a beautiful book. Uh, some of that was practical, like we couldn't get photos of all of these objects. Some of them are lost to time. Some of them are in museums. Some of them you have to like, are in private collections. So some of it was practical, but some of it, most of it was they wanted to look, no matter how the words turned out, they wanted to be able to sell the book, <laughs> in other words. And that's kind of how I do it too. I'm like, if you don't turn a single page of this book, you're going to like having this on your shelf. You're going to like having this on your, on your table. It's just gorgeous. The artist is John McNair. And if you look at his work, he's on Instagram. Um, not so much on Twitter, but on Instagram. He creates entire strange, odd worlds with his art. And they're beautiful. And you, once you see one illustration by him, you, you, you'll recognize his work for the rest of your life. Um, and, you know, he, they, just, they, they just knew what to do. They knew Cork is so buttoned up. They know how to make something beautiful that I didn't even have to know. I didn't even know that it was going to be shiny until I got my author copies. copies. I mean, they didn't even tell me it was going to be shiny. They showed me like this, this like JPEG of a book, a, a JPEG that just looked like, you know, a cartoon illustrated book on the front. And you get it and you're like, oh, my goodness, why did they not tell me this? So, again, like Sam said, these books, I have Sam's right here as well. They feel good. You pick them up and they just feel nice in your hands. And like, uh, I don't know, it's you can just tell when a book has, has love in it. You yeah, know? and then for anyone in the audience who is saying, well, I'm a digital reader. Well, don't be a digital reader for these two books. <laughs> you want to your bookshelves. It's a good point. Uh, so, you know, I was just thinking the last time that I saw you guys, Sam, you had a nonfiction book out and, and JW, you had a fiction book out. So we talk, <laughs> we talk about that a little bit and, and how do you decide what you're going to do next? And, and so, JW, why nonfiction this time? And, and Sam, why fiction? You want to start that one, JW? I'm fascinated by this. Sure. So I'm like uh, I'm like a three, three, uh, three-legged three person. So, like, what, I'll do a nonfiction, then I'll do an adult horror, then I'll do a, a middle-grade horror. And what happened with the, that was I actually actually shopped Twelve Nights. That was the fiction you're talking about, the uh, Twelve Nights of Rotter House. That was actually shopped to, to Quirk. The editor tried to pick it up. They couldn't get it sold internally. But that's how I got in contact about Cursed Objects. So, you know, because of the way my contracts are structured, I can't always just rush out and do another book in the same to the same audience, right? So I, I fill that time by doing the other one. So right now, I'm under a two book contract with Harper Collins for middle grade novels. So I can't really write another middle grade novel for somebody else while I'm doing that, but I can write an adult horror novel, or I can write a nonfiction book, no problem, without transgressing contracts. So it's ba it's basically um, uh, whatever's next to my cycle, whatever I have a hole for, and whatever's not under contract. That's what I can go chase. So, for me, you know, I think most of it is where my passion and my interests are directing me. If I, you know, I, after doing um, ostensibly three nonfiction books on the life of Ray Bradbury and then editing an anthology. I was a little bit burned out on footnote. I mean, that first Bradbury biography I did, the Bradbury Chronicles, was meticulously researched. I, I researched that book for five years before you know I wrote anything, and uh, I loved that. It felt like, and, and JW knows this instinctively. I mean, it's a treasure hunt, and there's a joy to that treasure hunt that is like no other. It's fan, it's a fantastic high when you land on something that you're like, bingo, I've, I've uncovered something nobody else has seen, or hands haven't touched this in generations. There's something really exhilarating about that. But after three nonfiction books, it just felt like a time for me to switch gears. Um, and I think, you know, I'm a college professor in an MFA program, and more writers today are writing across genre than not. I mean, more writers are writing screenplays, are writing theatrical plays, I mean, our man running tech today, the 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 heroic Cody, is is a phenomenal playwright. Alex, you've written an incredible illustrated children's book, and you guys do a lot of other things. And I think I think great writers write across media and write across genres. Um, and for me, it's more instinctual. So now, I'm at present. I'm weirdly, I'm writing a biopic. I'm writing a screenplay for a producer who's been at Paramount for ten years on the life of Bill Evans, which is a really dark, drug adled 50s, mid-century story. So I'm knee deep back in sort of bi biographical research and I'm doing a screenplay and I'm also doing a book that is very JW, you know, it's very uh, haunted and non-fictional and it's creeping me out a little bit that I might be bringing some of this kind of bad juju into my house. I mean, it's, it's basically the story of Aleister Crowley buying a home on Loch Ness um, and he held rituals there, and they think a lot of people uh, 
don't think that he closed the portals that he opened and he 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 loosened the demons upon the land um later on jimmy page from led zeppelin bought it and lived there and there was a lot of tragedy involved in that and to me it's a multiple fires and death and bad news uh what's sort of really screwed that book up for me now is COVID. i mean i need to go to scotland and live for a time i was going to bring my kids to europe all this past summer and live and go over there i had events lined up and covid has really screwed that all up but that's fine you know i mean we adjust and and it's cool but it's funny i mean i think jason goes to jw goes to fiction and i go to nonfiction, and we're constantly kind of crossing the highway and running by each other with the cars coming at us i'll, I'll tell you what though that Bolskin idea is I'm, I'm jealous of that one that's a great idea it may not happen because of this freaking pandemic you know <laughs> is, is the crowley house inhabited now is somebody living there no it's burned so oh. many times that there now is a foundation rebuilding it but it overlooks a cemetery which is totally jw and it over and then the cemetery overlooks the lock which overlooks the monster you know if you believe in it um and so it's still there they're rebuilding it there's a foundation right now that's raised money uh and they're rebuilding it one brick at a time uh, but the story of it is fantastic. Yeah, I heard you can also buy pieces of it to help support it if you wanted to buy a piece of bulk for a house, which I've, I've thought about. I've There's always objects, man. <laughs> I, I think it's funny that you, you, Sam, decried footnotes, and then literally in your first story in this collection, you footnote the story. Oh, my God, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But so speaking of footnotes, so JW, how much, how many, going into the research for this, how many of these stories did you know? And like, did you start with just an index and then... That's the interesting part, and that's one of the reasons why you know the, the project was actually brought to me um, originally hmm. uh, to see if I was interested in it. And it turned out I had visited a lot of that stuff, so the ta the table of contents changed constantly. So we had I'd, I had to make a very strict rule for what a cursed object was, because you know it crosses lines with haunted objects and possessed objects. Hmm. It had to be like it had to have bodies. <laughs> People had to actually die. It couldn't just been like a random myth. Um, and they had to be, have a story behind them. Like there's a few accursed objects that are amazing. I wrote about one the other day on my blog about a cursed uh, Egyptian, a cursed rug that's made of cat hair. It's the oldest mm -hmm. rug on the planet, 2,400 years old. But I couldn't include it in the book because nobody had died from it. They're on the record, even in lore, even in like the lore part of the, the story, nobody died from it. And it kind of have deaths to be a cursed object. Otherwise you're just, you know, an object. So yeah, I, so I visited a bunch already, honestly, and then this gave me the opportunity to visit more and to, to write about stuff that I hadn't visited, which is new for me, because stuff, again, was either lost to time or it was you know, the, the width of the world away and I just couldn't get over there. But yeah, that's that's really why this project fit me and why I said yes to it in the end, because it would have been, and I I mean, as long as I had certain rules, I had to be able to, be, to put myself in the book and I had to, all these things that had to be a, a J.W. Oker book for me to take it on, which Cork was happy with, completely happy with. Um, but yeah, it was it fit me like so perfectly. I couldn't believe I didn't come up come up with it myself. Hmm. It's uh, interesting. So my my next door neighbor is uh, his his son is he's seven years old. And last night he was asking me a bunch of Halloween questions. Uh, do you do you know Michael Myers? Oh yeah, I know Michael Myers. Do you know Jason? Yeah, I know Jason. And he goes, Do you know Annabelle? I go, Oh, I met Annabelle because you know we're in Connecticut and. Yeah. They, they, as in your book, they bring her around in a lit box and tell you, don't go near it because she'll kill you. But also, if you want to take a selfie in front of it, please do after dinner. So. <laughs> that was the one rule the publisher gave me for this book was Annabelle has to be in it. <laughs> that was it. Was it. <laughs> you know, if I could say, I, I kind of geek out reading your Twitter feed, JW, with, with like, so last weekend, I'm stalking you now. Like you were on the, you said you've been on the road for like 30 plus hours in the car uh, with your wife. One, you have the most patient wife in the world to do that, to drive around. Uh, but, you know, I always have said that Ray Bradbury owned Autumn like no other writer. You know, he, he cap captured Autumn in Something Wicked This Way Comes or um, The Halloween Tree. But your photos that you guys take uh, around New England, they are the best autumnal photographs I think I've ever seen. I mean, you wear Autumn so well, dude. It's That's unbelievable. Yeah, so Lindsay's a photographer. That's all Lindsay. I don't. I, mean, I take photos, but you can tell which one are mine. They're just like dry and bland and perfectly centered up to the object. So all the great photos are Lindsay's. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, she's really great at it. And we just actually we just had a bunch printed from those articles, and we're about to like decorate the house with them. But yeah, it's it's partially yeah, again, it's all New, all Lindsay, and then of course it's New England. <laughs> New England being pretty. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons why I moved yeah. up here. 
Yeah. Well, as somebody who has a dog literally named Autumn, I agree with Sam. You <laughs> <laughs> I will say I do have my one of my daughter's middle name is Autumn, so I definitely am obsessed, is similarly obsessed. Um so let's talk. Well, actually, uh, just because we're, we're talking about uh, your trips and, and, and the podcast, which is so cool. Do you have a, a favorite haunted place? For, for me? Yeah. Ha, man, I do not know. I, I'm in that stage of like visiting where um, I really, <laughs> it's hard, hard for me to choose among the children. Like everything is like jumbled in my head. And I don't know what's weird to other people anymore. I've broken my weird meter. So <laughs> I don't know. Like <laughs> this thing I'm obsessed with is only weird to me now or if everybody else thinks it is. But I always, I mean, I don't know. People know. People know I love Salem, so that's one of the places I go to probably the most in the autumn, uh, or the, that's my biggest tradition. Probably is going to Salem every, you know, I've gone every year at least once, usually three or four times, uh, since like 2007. So uh, that's kind of my favorite spooky place in autumn is, is Salem. It just it just has everything you need there. Yeah. And now, now it has COVID, but <laughs> you don't need that, I guess. <laughs> Sam, let's talk about uh, this. So, so you, this is—I mean, you're obviously not a, a debut writer by any means, but this is your debut fiction collection, which yeah. is which is weird to say, right? So, oh. uh, your first fiction short stories. Why? Oh, you know, that's what my agent said. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm asking you, you know, yes. like, please, where's your goddamn novel? Um, you know, um, I love short stories. I love the form of short stories. I grew up reading the short stories of Ray Bradbury, Edgar Allan Poe. Short, the, the short stories of Sherlock Holmes, to me, are vastly superior to the four novels, by and large. Uh, not completely, but mostly. Um, I love the short story form, and I do not buy this, um, this myth that's been perpetuated literally for decades by the publishing establishment that short story collections do not sell and that hence publishers don't want to buy them. I, I think that's, a, you know, I have a rejection letter in my files from Farrar, Strauss and Guru uh, slam dunking a rejection on Ray Bradbury for the illustrated man. Now that book's never been out of print and they're basically saying we don't want this because short story collections don't sell. Well, it, it's been in print for 70 years and there are countless writers. I, I really admire the work of Joe Hill, the son of Stephen King. I think his short story collections, 20th Century Ghost to me is a Bible. I love that book deeply. Um, and so I just love the form. Um, I, I think in an attention, ADHD adult society, the joy of climbing into bed at night for 15 minutes and having the beginning, middle and end and the full narrative arc of a story and the emotional, uh, experience in 15 minutes close it and you're done is incredibly gratifying and and so I, that's i just love the form and to write that is incredibly challenging to create characters to create a universe and to have a narrative arc and then to get out of it all in a matter of you know three four five thousand words is immensely challenging yeah it's also interesting because i think today we consume content in in very much that way i mean we binge things in episode you know in, in episodes and it, we don't really go to, well no one goes to the movies anymore but like fly manor is eight episodes you know i mean that's how we watch television now so uh and and i do see more short story collections um especially this year which i want to get into because this year uh you know real world horrors aside for a second it's been like a bellwether year for horror fiction. Uh, so I want to talk to you both about that. JW, do you have any, any like any insight? Any What's your hot take? Why has this year been so good for, for horror? So I think uh, some, some people will say, obviously, we're in kind of horrific times. But obviously, this has been bubbling for a few years. I mean, the publishing cycle is, is you know, yeah. glacial. Um, so I, I, I think it was just in the water. I think a lot of writers... I think the horror genre itself has changed. It's, it's taken itself seriously, which it hasn't always done. So you get movies that are kind of more almost literary. And then you get writers like, you know, Stephen Graham Jones and Paul Tremblay, who, um, Akatsu, she's, she's another one, who just writes horror, but it's, it's literary. It's, it's meaty. It's beautiful. It's, it's everything you want out of a book. It so happens to be, you know, full of monsters and killers. So I think the writers are changing. I think... You know, so, in the same way that you you watch like a you know a Mike Flanagan's miniseries like Bly Manor or Haunted, it, it feels like a master kind of making the craft better. You know, the craft has gotten better. Like we have a higher standard for that now. I feel like that's happening with the with the horror genre as well, and that's all it takes. I mean, re there's a reason why a lot of us obsessed have obsessed with the horror genre our entire lives. We just love it. So the second you can make it a little bit more 
you know, mainstream or a little bit more palatable to broader audiences, people are going to love it. So I think, uh, I think that's why I think it's just kind of, I don't want to say growing up. I don't think, I don't think the genre's growing up at all, but I think it's kind of taken on, um, it's, it's kind of taken itself seriously in a good way, not in a bad way. I think it's taking itself seriously in a good way. Um, so I think that's what it is. I think it's just, there's this movement inside the genre that's affecting, you know, the mainstream. But I'm totally guessing. <laughs> No, I, we were talking before a, a little bit about it, and I, I agree. I think what we were talking about kind of the horror renaissance in the 80s with the, the paperback horrors that made authors a bucket load of money. Yeah. But I think part of the problem yeah. why it didn't continue into the 90s and the early 2000s was that the, the quality wasn't there, you know, towards the, the back end of it. And, and as you say, JW, the, the, the writing this year has been, I, I mean, Stephen, you mentioned Stephen's book, but Only Good Indians is just a masterwork. Mm -hmm. uh, Agreed. Yeah. Sam, what do you what do you think? I mean, I, I mean, and, and again, I don't want to just say that, that Dark Black is a collection of horror stories because it's not. As you yeah. mentioned, it's very it's Brad Berry in, in in that it's it's really all over the, the genre map, which is why I love it so much. And I think that, that people looking to, to pick it up really should because you find, you know, one night you're in a horror story, the other night you're another night you're not. So um, you're I, I appreciate you saying this. I mean, I, I really approach this book by with the, the mantra of you don't need a ghost in a story to be haunted. Mm. Um, you know, everybody's haunted. We're all haunted. Um, and so I wanted stories that sometimes there was the literal supernatural and then there were stories that it was haunted by your own psyche or your broken heart. Um, and I think that I, I, you know, I can't, it's just, I'm just, theorizing as to the this incredible renaissance we're going through with horror um it, it it's undeniably remarkable and i think it's literary you know i think we're seeing more and more writers dare to you know defy just the label of being a genre writer and saying no i'm a genre writer and i'm a literary writer i'm writing things that reflect the human condition um mexican gothic by sylvia Moreno Garcia, you know, and uh, Paul Tremblay, which uh, JW mentioned, and so many others. I mean, I, I think that, you know, for me, as, as you guys both know, all roads kind of always go back to Bradbury. And this guy was doing it in the 40s, you know, where, and Edgar Allan Poe was doing it in the 18, in the mid 1800s, where you're, you're, you, you're fusing genre, quote unquote, the stories of the dark fantastic with elements of tried and true literary storytelling, characterization, description, poetry of language. And we're just seeing a shit ton of that. It's remarkable and, and it's exciting. And I, it's also happening for that matter, very much in science fiction too, with N.K. Jemison, who just won the MacArthur Genius Grant and, and other writers. But there is a bonafide movement in, you know, particularly I think Gothic horror right now, that's just irresistible and cool and, and welcome. And I think it's reflecting not, you know, it predated the pandemic, as as JW said. I mean, people were writing these books five, ten years ago, but I think they're reflecting the fears of 9-11 and being attacked. They're reflecting the fears of economic collapse that we all started to experience in 08. They're reflecting the fears of the rise of white nationalism again and, um, you know, and, and, and the hate and the divide in our country. And so I think... Art expresses our most inner feelings, and horror is doing that in droves right now. So uh, before we kind of move on to the next uh, segment tonight, because I do want to get to the next part, because I think everybody's going to really love this next part. But um, And you've both touched on it. But so some, can you talk about some stories that have really influenced you uh, and, and like, or, or even just the types of stories that, that influenced you in, in your writing and maybe the ones that just really dug you know, sunk in deep. Uh, JW, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is one of the reasons why, you know, me and Sam are friends is Bradbury is just one of my just main motivations. I mean, he's a, he's known mainstream as a science fiction writer, but the way I came a, came to him is for his darker works, right? His Halloween tree and his Something Wicked yeah. This Way comes, even Dandelion Wine, which, or which is, you know, gets, gets dark. Um, and that was it. That was kind of my big influence. I don't, I don't, um, I'm a bad at being a, a, a fan. I think I'm bad at like finding the people I like, just following them to death, following following other works. I'm just bad at it. I'm just too scatterbrained for that. But Bradbury was one that just stuck for me. Like the second I discovered him, uh, you know, I, I everything about him. I, I'm I'm always trying to get two. I'm pr trying to do two things that Bradbury did. Nat Bradbury did naturally. One is to like infuse, no matter what you're writing, to infuse it with joy. You can just tell on the paper that he's having a blast. 
And that, that's something I, I, I have trouble with. I'm much more cynical than he is, I think. But I, I totally appreciate that. I wish I could like just feel like my pages were dashed off with a hot pen right before he throws it, throws it in the bucket of water beside him. Um, and the other just is, is use of language. You know, that's something that, you know, I, I would love to aspire to. I don't even think I aspire to it. It's just the way he could write about anything in a paragraph. And it sounds like the most beatific thing on the planet. Um, right now, I'm doing one of my annual rereads of something wicked. And that thing is just, you know, poetry. Every single character in one of his books is a poet. Um, and that's yeah. I, if I could get one character in one of my books to be a poet, I'd be happy. <laughs> but he, this, so his use of words and his, his sense of joy in his writings is something that I keep as like a North Star that I just constantly continually miss. But it's, it's up there still. I can be looking at it. Boy, you just summed that up perfectly. I mean, for me, obviously, not to, to continue to be a broken record on Bradbury. So maybe I'll pick some other writers. I mean, um, you know, going way back, someone who's not often cited, who's really influenced me, and he was also a nonfiction writer and a fiction writer, is Ambrose Bierce. Mm -hmm. You know, Ambrose Bierce was a contemporary of Mark Twain, and he wrote The Devil's Dictionary, this incredibly witty book of def very cynical definitions. Um, but he wrote, of course, this sort of iconic work of pre-M. Night Shyamalan twist ending fiction called An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Uh, which I hope you've all read. I mean, it's to me, it's the best work of Civil War horror um, and uh, ever written. I mean, and, and it was adapted. It was made into a short film that won the Cannes Film Festival in the early 1960s. And then Rod Serling loved that short film so much that that's the only time he actually purchased an outside short film to include in the Twilight Zone. Um, so Ambrose Bierce, if you read. He did a book called Can Such Things Be, I believe is the title, and, and it's science fictional, it's horror, and it's it's civil war, and it's it's creepy and remarkable. And so, you know, I think it, it's nice to go back and see where all this started. Um, even Dickens with Christmas Carol and exploring the, the, the fantastic and that. Um, so to kind of, we look at the renaissance that's going on right now, and then it's interesting to, to me personally to go back and see the forefathers who were exploring the genre then and how they were expanding the bond boundaries and playing with it. Hmm. So, all right, so the next piece here, I think everybody's in for a treat because you both are, are collectors and you guys have such cool stuff and, and only some of your stuff is, is cursed, right, JW? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. a small percentage is okay to, to touch. So for this, <laughs> for this next part, uh, you guys are going to share some pieces from your personal collections with with the audience. So, uh, yeah. who who would like to start? Well, I think right away we're going to start and say that JW is going to blow me out of the water on this game because I mean this guy he's already told me what he owns. It's insane. <laughs> uh, but but I, I brought a couple things tonight. But so you start it, JW. All right, I'll start. I'll show you something that looks really dumb to own, and then I'll tell you about it. Then you might still say it's dumb to own. How about that? All right. I have to be very careful not to mix it up because there's two things. <laughs> All right, you ready? Yeah. So I own two bricks. See this? Two bricks. So which which one of these bricks? This brick is from Edgar Allan Poe's house in Greenwich, New York. Oh, my God. This, this brick is from Ray I Bradbury know. Cheviot Hill's house in I LA. know that brick. <laughs> you know this brick? Huh? This particular brick? So <laughs> I, somehow I started collecting bricks. <laughs> no, I only have two. But, you know, from two big influences for me to, like, uh, now I'm really going to mix them up, mix them up. Um, two big influences for me, two big, I'm a big artifact guy. I like physical things. So when I learned I could get a brick from Poe's house and a, oh, Poe's house and a brick from Ray Bradbury's house, I, I jumped on both. Like I couldn't, couldn't not buy a brick, you know, and say it's from a famous per person's house. So I'm in the market for a Flannery O'Connor brick. If anybody knows where one is, that's what I want next. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. So I also have a brick. I didn't bring it tonight, but I have a brick from the fireplace. And I just to authenticate it, you know, I spent 12 years in that house. I can tell you for a fact that the effervescence on that brick, that white sort of phosphate or whatever that is, that's on my brick, and that was on the brick in his house. So, I mean, I'm authenticating it visually <laughs> uh, as a primary source that that brick awesome. is legit. I'll put that in my files because I need all of that kind of stuff. All right. Guys, I'd love to have a brick. Anyway, go ahead, Sam. <laughs> you know, I had two pieces of the exterior of Ray Bradbury's house. They demolished the thing. It was just tragic. Yeah. Uh, after he passed away, they tore it down. And I have two pieces of the facade, and I 
one to Neil Gaiman. Otherwise, Alex, I would have given it to you. I mean, I saved one for myself, but if anybody else has that dandelion yellow stucco that they're willing to give to the great uh, host of this evening's event, send it to him because he deserves it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, what do you got, Sam? All right, uh, all right. So this, it, it, we're you know, obviously my collection is sort of relegated to Bradbury. I'm not, you know, JW is out collecting curse objects, and I think for that he should get some sort of award um, that his wife and children are are are, are willing to let these objects into the home. And I asked him this last year when we went out to lunch, it's like, does it ever worry you? And you've got cojones of titanium, my friend, to let all that stuff in. But this object, uh, so most of my stuff is Bradbarian, um, but this one is a pretty cool thing. I don't know that you can see this, but it ties into Halloween. Oh. Uh, this is a telegram from Western Union, as you can all see. The acceptance um, in April of 1946 from Mademoiselle Magazine. This is the original telegram uh, from Mademoiselle Magazine from George Davis, who is the editor of Mademoiselle, to Ray Bradbury. They spelled his name wrong. They spelled it, kind of interestingly enough, Ray Bardbury, with a little Shakespearean twist there. Um, he was living at 670 Venice Boulevard uh, with his parents at the time. So he's 26 years old, still living at home with mom and dad. So Gen Z uh, kids who have moved home don't have to despair. Um, but here is the acceptance for, um, I think, what uh, the story that Neil Gaiman often cites as one of the most influential stories in his development, the homecoming, about a family of ghouls having their, their homecoming in their Victorian mansion in North, uh, northern Illinois, uh, and the winged creatures and the, the beasts of the night all gathering for a family reunion. And the story is told from the point of view of Timothy, who tragically has no uh, bestial powers, no monstrous abilities. Uh, while the rest of his family is nocturnal, he, is, uh, he, he's, he sleeps uh, during the night. And it's really a story of um, adolescence, but that's the acceptance for the homecoming. You can see that he got paid, I think it's $400, not a bad uh, chunk of change in 1946 for a short story. And the addendum to this is it was published in the October uh, 47 issue of Mademoiselle and Charles Adams, the great New Yorker cartoonist and inventor of, or creator of the Adams family illustrated that story. Um, so that is really Bradbury history right there. Yeah, that's awesome. I've actually I actually have an eBay search term for that Mademoiselle issue. It's beautiful. It's like a full page spread of the homecoming from from Adams, and it's like oh, it's a gorgeous piece. Never it's comes up, never comes up on eBay though. <laughs> it's incredible. Oh, that's super cool. Um, I should have asked you guys before this. <laughs> JW, do you have another one to show? I can show you anything. My desk is scattered. Do you guys? Um, I'll show you this. This I mentioned this in the cursed objects book, so let me get a little bit relevant. So this is not a cursed object, but it's uh, it's a it's from from the gift shop of a cursed cursed object. That makes sense. <laughs> so this is um, a replica of Robert the doll. I don't know how familiar you are with that guy. So Robert the doll is a cursed doll out in the Keys in Florida. Mm -hmm. It's about it's this is not a life size. The life size is like I think four feet tall. It's a big one. It's a big big doll. And wow. the idea is it's on display at a museum down there in um in Keys. And the idea is, if you disrespect the doll while it's you know on display, you will bad stuff will happen to you. Um, you need to ask before taking a picture. You need to not joke about him. He's in a little rocking chair, if you see, <laughs> a little tiny rocking chair. But um, and they have letters. the The museum has letters from all over the country of people who are writing to apologize to Robert the doll because they they got home after disrespecting him in some way and bad stuff started to happen to them. So they immediately thought, oh my, oh my goodness, it's Robert the Doll, the curse of Robert the Doll. So they immediately you know, just sent off an apology letter, sent it to the museum uh, and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for just making a fun of the giant doll with the uh, crazy looking face. <laughs> and then you go to the gift shop and you can buy a miniature version of him. So I have one sitting on my desk uh, as part of that. And it is a little creepy, let me see. That is cool. All right, All right I'll, do, I'll do one more. Um, this is, well, you know, I got a couple things here. So this is, if you've read the Halloween tree, I think JW just talked about how uh, something wicked is part of your annual reading tradition. 
The Halloween Tree is another one that we could make our October read. And when I first started working with Ray Bradbury, I went to my mailbox and he had sent me this. Oh. Um, you know, and it's signed by Joseph Mignani and Ray Bradbury. Now, it's not an original. I do have one original in my house. Um, I didn't pull that off the wall tonight, but this is a very limited print uh, by Mignani, signed by Mignani and Bradbury very faintly um, from the Halloween tree. That's Mound Shroud. Um, so that that is a that's one of the keepsakes uh, in my home. The other thing I, I thought I would show... It's a very prized possession for me. Um, if I can sneak two in really quickly, sure. is um, Bradbury when he was a teenager published his own zine, and there were only 100 issues of each. This is issue number two uh, of Futuria Fantasia, published in the fall of 1939. I mean, it's very, very brittle. Um, oh God, be careful, please. I know. Um, <laughs> it's it very, very brittle. Uh, but you can see it's typed. It's got ink blotches on it. If you all know your horror history, Forrest Ackerman, who started Famous Monsters Magazine and coined the term um, sci-fi, actually, he had heard hi-fi being associated with high-fidelity stereos. And he, he said, well, if high-fidelity is for music, then sci-fi is for science fiction. And so... Forrest Ackerman worked at the Academy of Motion and Picture Sciences in the late 30s, and they had access to a mimeograph machine, and so they would sneak in there on Sundays and print these things for free. Um, and this is the only issue I own of the four that Bradbury did. Almost all the stories are written in this by Ray Bradbury. They're absolutely, as he would say if you were here, terrible. They're, it's really bad. It's juvenile, high school, middle school writing. It's terrible. Uh, but he was learning, and he was... He was growing into the Ray Bradbury we would all know and love. And so that's that's one of my prized collections. The cover is illustrated by Hannes Bach, who who brought a real sort of art deco sensibility to his fantasy science, uh, fantasy artwork and went on to win a, a Hugo Award for his art later in life. That's so cool. Yeah, and I say this, I mean, I like, I like Sam a lot, but I really am hoping he falls on hard times at some point so I can pick some of this stuff off him, honestly. <laughs> My my electrical bill is due now, so anything you want to buy there. I mean. <laughs> JW, do you want to do one more? Do you? Do you uh, sure, I can do stuff. So, I, do you want to see another Bradbury? Or you want to see non Bradbury? I'll let you ch choose, Alex. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see a Bradbury. Okay, so um, I have right here uh, everything. Everything. Everything you see behind me is pretty much Bradbury. Um, mm -hmm. that, that coat is Bradbury's, actually. But I'll show you this one because I, I'm a big fan of this one I have right here. So this is one of them. Um, he had a lot of Halloween decorations, and I own some of them. This is one of the ones I own, um, and I'm a big. I like this one a lot just because of, because Ray would always tell the story of you know being just a descendant of one of the witch trial, uh, uh, not victims because I don't think she was hung, but uh, one of the accused of the witches, Mary Bradbury. Mary Bradbury. And, yeah, and so I got to go. Uh, I actually know where she's buried. So one of the things I got to do up here, she's buried up in or down in Massachusetts or down for me, um, and got to go see her grave. I have wow. this witch. Is, so I this, it, obviously I have a big obsession with the witches because of my Salem work as well. So Salem, Halloween, Ray Bradbury, this kind of all wraps up to be the single artifact. And we put it out every, actually it's out in my study all year round, but at Halloween we put it out. I also have some of his like uh, pumpkin decorations with candles that he burned himself that are still kind of pools of wax around it. So again, great, like uh, Sam said earlier, Bradbury is fall to me. He's like a, such an indelible part of it. I can't separate, I can't have, I can't celebrate a fall without doing numerous things around around Ray Bradbury. So th this kind of is my iconic object that kind of puts all those threads together into one one piece for me. Ah, that's so cool. That is so cool, man. So let's uh, let's kind of wrap this segment. So Sam, I know, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, but I want to hear a Ray Bradbury story that JW and I don't know. Oh, man. Um, you know, there are a couple. There's OK, so I'll give you all a, a democratic choice here. One is one shows a side of Ray Bradbury that is a little ju is quite juvenile and irascible, and one is very Halloweenish, um, and I'll let you choose between the two guys. Which one would you rather? You pick this one. I'm I'm up for a Halloween story. Same. All right, all right, very cool. Um, so uh, if you follow my Twitter feed, you saw some photos I tweeted in the last week of Ray Bradbury carving jack o' lanterns in his home. We went and bought a bunch of pumpkins, and I mean, I, I had the weird and incredibly surreal 
uh, opportunity to carve pumpkins with Ray Bradbury in his home. Um, we carved a couple pumpkins and then uh, we sat at his door and he had a Polaroid camera. He'd sit in a chair and hand candy out. And the guy, the, you know, these are eight year old kids and nobody had any idea who this elderly man was giving them candy bars and stuff. He just beamed with delight at distributing candy. He loved Halloween all the way back to his childhood. Um, and he, I think he was more tickled by the experience of handing the candy out to them than they were of receiving it. But what was really funny is to see the parents' response when they'd walk up these field stone steps to his front door. The kids thought it was just somebody's grandfather handing them candy. And the parents, some of them, not all of them, but some, they, their faces would explode because they're like, holy shit, Ray Bramberry is giving me candy for Halloween. And so... We had that experience, and he would Bradbury would take photos of all the kids in their costumes of the Polaroid. He just loved it so much. And that night, after he had handed candy out, we went to a, a steakhouse in Santa Monica that he loved, and uh, it started to rain. I mean, just torrentially. It was just almost to the point where the wipers are thumping on the windshield, and we're we're coming home. We both had a couple drinks. We had a great evening out. It's Halloween night. You can't see three feet in front of the car. I'm driving a literary legend on two martinis and a torrential downpour. Uh, no pressure there. And we're cutting down a side street in West Los Angeles towards his home. And there's this massive, beautiful tree in someone's yard. And there's jack-o'-lanterns in it. And they're all lit up with candles inside of them even in the rain because the lids were on top of the can on top of the jack-o'-lanterns and it was also canopied by the tree and we round this bend and we literally see a halloween tree lit up uh and he's sitting in the passenger seat and he said stop and i stopped the car in the middle of the road and we sat in a torrential rainstorm and looked at this tree with illuminated jack-o'-lanterns up in the branches and he just started to sob he just started to weep and I, I you know he was a very emotional guy but i think it's halloween night he had written a book called the halloween tree in 1972 uh, and and then to see the physical manifestation of that book in front of his face through a tor torrential rainstorm and these illuminated jack-o'-lanterns calling out to us I think just the emotionality of the whole thing just absolutely hit him. And I looked over and there were just, he had those beautiful giant Coke bottle glasses and there's just tears streaking down his cheeks. I mean, the windshield's covered in rain and his face is covered in tears as he had seen the physical manifestation of his 1972 book, The Halloween Tree. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Incredible. Okay. I think the uh, sequel to your Live Forever story needs to be trick-or-treating at Ray Bradbury's. That's what it needs to be. <laughs> so we are, I mean, somehow this hour has just flown, guys. And, and uh, so why, let's, uh, there's no better way, no, no better place to end it than on that story. So uh, what I'd like to do just before we go out is um, I'd ask you both to uh, give, give our viewers a book that, that you're either reading now or, or you've read during the last couple of months that you'd like to uh, – to mention and then uh, to shout out a uh, your favorite um, independent bookstore because we all know that that uh, bookstores are really going through it right now. So uh, JW, why don't we start with you? Sure. So usually what I'm reading is whatever I'm writing at the time. So if I'm writing a middle grade story, I'm reading middle grade. If I'm doing nonfiction, I'm writing nonfiction uh, or I'm reading nonfiction. And right now I'm writing middle grade horror. So the book I've been reading um, for the past few days, I'm almost done with it, is um, I don't know if you see it, but uh, scary stories for uh, young foxes. It's beautiful. Like, I'm not usually one, even in my middle grade taste, I'm not usually one for anthropomorphized animals for characters. I like, I like kids for characters. But, man, this is really beautiful, really kind of gory, and it, it definitely goes dark, even though it looks like it's about fables for kids. It's, it's, it's about seven foxes, uh, seven kits, young foxes, and each going through a, uh, basically a horror story. And it's beautifully written. It's, it's uh, Christian McKay Heidecker. Uh, it's like his second or third book, but it is, uh, it's got a Newberry, Newberry honor. You can see that seal on it, but it's, it's really good. I, you could read it with your kids. You can read it by yourself you, as, as adults. I'm a big fan of those kinds of books you can go both ways with. And then my independent bookstore is the one here in my town in Nashua, New Hampshire. That's Toadstool Books. Um, it's great. It's the one I go to. I'm there, you know, every other Sunday or so I'm there. 
Um, they're very kind to me as well. They, they're the ones that stock my signed stock. But even before they were doing that, I, that was my that was my uh, bookstore of choice. Um, there's actually three in New Hampshire. There's there's, there's uh, one in Keene and one in Petersburg. So it's one of the rare independent bookstores that actually is a chain technically, mm -hmm. but all in, it's independently owned. Um, so, but again, they have one in my town, and that's the one that I, I love the most. A Toadstool Shop. If you want, if you want a signed copy from Toadstool, it is in the uh, the the chat there. And and just to, to back up on your book recommendation, I read um, it's uh, his Attack of the Fifty Foot Wallflower. Yeah, which, you, that's what's next on my list. Is that good? I was gonna say you guys are both like it's bad shit. It is a weird <laughs> book. Awesome. It's just it's super cool. Yeah, and Perfect. it's illustrated and beautiful. Yeah, so. Sam, your turn. Uh, well, you know, you got you got to plug this thing because this is a gorgeous book, you know. And and we all have these autumn reads, but this now is added to my autumn bookshelf. Uh, this is really a fun book. I love books that are sort of pastiches where there's you can dive in anywhere you want and open it up. I love movies that allow you to do that, where you can kind of anywhere you start, you can engage. And the way this book is constructed, you can do that with these little vignettes about Cursed Object. This is a fabulous book, you guys. The only other one I would say right now that I revisit regularly outside of Bradbury, this is a remarkable um, and two-volume anthology called American Fantastic oh, yeah. Tale. It's edited by Peter Straub, and I revisit this annually, and I'm revisiting it now. There's two volumes. One uh, is the beginning uh, 1800s to the early 1940s, and then this edition is 1940s to now. Stephen King, Harlan Ellison, um, Ray Bradbury, um, it, Tennessee Williams. I mean, this book is it, a short story. It, this is the best short story and horror anthology out there, and you can get it. You can get it um, on on Amazon used. Uh, pretty affordably. In fact, both my copies are library copies with library cards and stamped inside. Um, this is a great, great anthology and really good to revisit every Halloween. Um, and a, a local and a bookstore. Oh, a bookstore. You know, I so so JW went to his supportive local, so I'll do the same. I mean, we both tour and we we have affinity for bookstores around the country and world. I mean, I, McNally Jackson in New York has always been great to me. I love that store. I, Powell's in Portland is my favorite bookstore on earth because it's a citywide block. But if I'm going to go to a mom and pop and shout one out in this time where we see Indies closing uh, tragically because of the pandemic, um, I have a bookstore that, that has been so good to me um, in Chicago called The Bookseller, C-E-L-L-A-R. Um, and you can order Dark Black there, all signed as well. Um, and the owner has done events with me constantly if i call it the most outlandish they call it off-site event like i'll do an event at a science lab and talk about ray bradbury science fiction she'll go with me so it's the bookseller uh in chicago just you know support your indies right now jeffrey bezos is becoming a james bond villain he could buy multiple <laughs> islands and take a rocket to mars you know and and not spend even a fraction of his income our independent booksellers are suffering right now badly, and we need to support them. We really do, or we're going to lose them. Yep. I don't yeah. want to buy all my books on the internet. Yeah, amen. Um, and and I will, as as someone whose other dog is named Harlan, I'll totally back up your uh, <laughs> that those short story collections are fantastic. Um, so, guys, again, just the hour flew by. Thank you both so much for being here. I'm going to wrap it up with my uh, my favorite Bradbury quote. Uh, <laughs> And it's, I have never listened to anyone who criticized my taste in space travel, sideshows, or gorillas. When this occurs, I pack up my dinosaurs and I leave the room. <laughs> we are going to leave the room on that. To everybody watching, thank you all so much. Please stay safe. Be well. Happy Halloween. And to Sam and JW, guys, my heartfelt thanks so much. It was so great seeing you, and we will see you down the road. Yeah, thanks so much for this. It's a lot of fun. Really awesome. fun. Great to see you guys, and thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night.